the original usability silo is what I've entitled it, right? Where we have all of these analog companies here, you know, Midas, Yamaha, Soundcraft, all, all the stalwarts uh, that were making analog consoles. And the thing is, uh, there was no real compatibility issues with regard to not only interface, but also usability, right? We were at a, at a point in, at the height of analog and the height of processing where it's like, if, if I know how to use the little Mackie 12 channel, I could probably walk in on the biggest SSL console in the studio and find my way around. I could probably do it. It's similar, right? Really, really similar workflow from the very bottom of the market to the very top of the market was an analog workflow. And on top of it, uh, all the manufacturers that made processing were compatible with all of those consoles. If I have a Yamaha SPX90, show me the console it won't work with, right? It will work with everything, right? And same thing for all the different manufacturers, uh, et cetera. You know, they all made processing that would work on any console. Uh, we could certainly change it around and do all kinds of things. And uh, certainly from a manufacturer's perspective, this was a pretty good place to be because they had the maximum cu customer base available to them, right? I mean, they could make one product that would work everywhere. So every customer on the planet was in play for them, right? Now, if we get to the user's perspective of that, uh, it's a very similar mindset, right? We could have users that were could be loyal or tribal to all of them. They, they didn't have to pick one and go to work. They could use anything. Uh, it was all at their disposal, regardless of what console they went to. They could move from console to console. If they had effects racks, they could move those with them to another console and interface them, no problem, right? I mean, short of maybe having to get through multi-pins or things like that, you know, just physical connections. Uh, but there was no compatibility issue with it, right? Everybody follow me there? Same thing for all of them. So, you know, the users in and of themselves could be loyal to everybody involved. And that was really the usability silo in analog. Everybody was in the same boat, right? Making sense to you? Now, when we move to digital, a little different uh, different situation now, right? We What we end up doing is end up with silos of users or tribal aspects of users that are loyal to any one given brand. And I, for my money, that is driven by all of these usability issues. Meaning, if I, if I know how to use Midas Digital, it has absolutely no bearing on whether I'm gonna be able to use Solid State Digital, or Digico Digital, or Avid Digital. There's just no bear, I mean, you gotta fly very, very high up to find commonality between those user interfaces, right? And it's not very much, it's not very big. So, that has also played into the processing that goes along with it, right? with digital consoles. We have uh, you know, this really big challenge of little to no compatibility of manufactured third-party processing between those consoles, right? Certainly can't load it on the consoles, right? So what that has created is kind of this tribal aspect. You know, we can't take the processing from one console and use it on another. We can't even take its, its settings, its processing settings and move it to another console. It just does not work. Uh, we can't do that. And, you know, this is kind of a, I don't want to say an Achilles heel, but it is, I think it is one of the things that have been, has been really, really underestimated by the manufacturing sector uh, for digital processing and digital consoles is the actual day-to-day -day workflow for a big chunk of sound engineers in this world, meaning not everybody picks a console and goes on tour for 10 months. There are lots of people that go night to night to night and are required to work night to night to night on a different console every night. In analog, that was not much of a problem. Certainly compared to today's situation, it was not much of a problem. That is a very big challenge right now. So my, for my money, my personal op-ed on it is that it's almost breaking our industry a little bit, okay? So this is a, this is a big problem. <laughs> so from the user's perspective here, uh, you know, the, the users end up having really not much choice. They have to kind of build this loyalty into each one of the consoles, and we create these kind of silos of users, right? Where, you know, we have Digico people, Avid people, and Midas people, right? They're tribal now, uh, and it's survival. It's like, I, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody over the last, I don't know, 10 years who has said to me, I turned down a gig because they had a console there that I ha was completely unfamiliar with. I, I just didn't want to come in and look like a complete idiot. And I was not going to get any time to train on it before I could do the show. 
So, you know, that's a, that's a really negative impact to our industry, you know, that that the manufacturers are really not looking out for, you know, or at least there's no overarching organization. I, you know, I would hope uh, that someday AES could kind of be that organization as kind of a monitoring station for manufacturers to try to build some commonality back into their designs, you know, to help us out. So this is a big issue. All right, do you guys identify with this? Have you run across this? Yeah, yeah, this is not uncommon. So we're going to take some really deep dives here. And this is going to be kind of dense, very PowerPointy, uh, but hopefully I can get you to think about certain things. And really, my goal at the end of this is just to try to build voice uh, in the industry. And you know, at some point, when I put my users hat on, when I put my pro users hat on, we need to get a lobby together to try to lobby back to the manufacturing sector to say, this is what needs to happen, people. This is what needs to happen in these designs. We, we cannot survive like this out here. It is not working, okay? So here we go. Let's compare it um, to some older models. Like I said, let's, uh, let's always kind of compare it to analog because I think it's a good contextualization of the, of the discussion. So here is, I, I put together a whole list of console manufacturers here. As you can see, this is about everybody I could think of. I'm sure there are others that I've left out of here. I just ran out of space. So. How do analog consoles address external processing? And remember, when we're talking about third-party processing, uh, third-party plugins, that's got to be considered an external processor, okay? So in this situation, obviously, there are consoles uh, manufacturers here who have never made analog consoles, Avid being one of them. So I'm going to subtract those out of this uh, to begin with. So this is what we've got left in terms of analog, right? Uh, so here's the question in terms of analog. And again, this is just to build contrast and context for the argument. Do, do any of these consoles offer, analog consoles offer internal effects, meaning internal reverbs and internal compressors, et cetera? No, they don't. None of them offered that, right? These are analog consoles. They're not going to have onboard processing. And keep in mind, too, just again for context, I'm making some very big generalizations here. You know, uh, we're not talking about any one specific model here. Just on whole, this would be the thinking for these manufacturers, all right? So no internal effects processing there. What is their support for outboard processing? Well, all models are supported, right? There's nothing that you couldn't plug into an analog console and probably make it work. It's going to be a plus 4, minus 10 sensitivity, balanced, unbalanced. We can get it in there somehow. Right? Okay, so they're very common there. <clears throat> How about the processing control for the external processors? Well, there's no tactile control on any of these. These are analog consoles. This is all going to be through the front panel of the processor, right? Whether it's a reverb or a compressor or whatever, we access it through the actual unit itself, okay? And then finally, what is the I.O.? And as I mentioned earlier, it's either plus 4 or minus 10. We can even include AES-CBU in here because we can convert it to analog if we want to do it. So you'll notice that all of them are the same, right? So uh, here's another way to look at this. I've given you two ways to look at this. We can look at it in this data form, or we can look at it in kind of a graph form. So just uh, the story here is just the uniformity of it, right? Doesn't matter how many consoles. In this situation, this is a seven console sample. They all have the same I.O. They all access processing through the front panel of the unit. They all have external support uh, for processing, meaning that all the units are available to it, and they all do not have internal effects processing. Okay? So completely linear. Okay? You with me so far? All right, so let's take a look at some pros and cons of hardware. Uh, you know, hardware external processing. Uh, and we're going to look at it first from the manufacturer's perspective here, all right? So from a manufacturer, a pro of that is it creates the maximum customer pool, right? They could create the, uh, create the maximum amount of revenue from making one of these devices and sell it out there. The potential is there. They got a hot product. They're going to sell a lot of them, okay? So that's, a, that's attractive to them. Uh, we have long-established interface protocols. We don't have to R&D or re-engineer some, some new way to transport audio to and from the device. It's been around as long as Pro Audio has been around, right? The plus 4, minus 10, balanced, unbalanced. That's been around, so we don't have to re-engineer that. They love that. Uh, limited upgrade possibilities, meaning they're not going to be sending you upgrades for a new 1176 every two weeks or every two months or every two years. They're going to make it once, 
And maybe there might be some sort of hardware spin on a part or something like that, but it's not going to be an upgrade process on it. So the point of that from a manufacturer's perspective is low maintenance, right? We build it once, sell it a bunch. And then it's relatively secure from pirating. You know, you're not going to see too many people pirate hardware, you know. They'll re-engineer it or reverse engineer it sometimes, but it's, it's not going to be sold necessarily as the actual unit. Now, let's take a look at the cons of hardware for hardware manufacturers. The, one of the cons is a long lifespan and legacy value, meaning as they release new products, one of the things they're going to compete with is their old products. Audio is very, very particular in that situation where we have products that were made 60 years ago that are still viable in the market. We still want to use them. So, you know, the, these customer or these hardware manufacturers are going to have to compete against that when they get out in the world, right? Uh, heavy engineering demands. There's a lot of hardware engineering, a lot of mechanical engineering in these devices. It's really expensive to inventory, meaning it takes up lots of space. Uh, it's expensive to distribute. The heavier the unit is, the bigger the unit is, I've got to get it to my distribution network to get it out into the market. It's going to demand a repair services network, an RMA network. It's expensive to prototype, meaning we got to build versions of it before we release it. Uh, long times between generations of product dependent upon parts vendors. Uh, in the manufacturing world, it's called COGS, you know, cost of goods. You know, how much am I paying for this transistor? How much am I paying for this potentiometer? That's a huge piece of building any piece of hardware. Um, requires cooperative two-stage testing for each compatible platform, right? So uh, a lot of cons to what's going on uh, with hardware manufacturers. Uh, and honestly, uh, you know, not to, not to uh, go too far down the rabbit hole here, but, you know, you can kind of sum these up in a nutshell here, and it's probably, probably why we're never going to see large-frame analog live sound mixing consoles again. No manufacturer wants to address the burden of it because they're going to compete with all of these low-cost, more capable consoles. How many are you going to sell a year? A hundred? I, I, it's just not going to work. You know, we're probably not going to get back there ever anytime soon. So let's take a look at it from the sound for hire vendors, the sound companies. Let's take a look at what hardware looks like for them. Well, it's uh, predictable and compatible with its inventory. It knows that it can have these sitting on the shelf and it'll work with any of their inventory, right? So that's a good thing. Uh, it's a rentable item. Somebody can come to me and say, I need to rent your 224XL for a period of time, and there's a price for it, and you can generate revenue for it. Uh, it adds lever leverage to the bidding process. If you're trying to gain a bid, you can say to somebody, hey, I'll throw in all the eventide processing and, and create a value add for the bid, right? So it's leverage, actually, for a sound, re sound for hire vendor. Uh, it holds its value over time. It's not going to depreciate really rapidly and where we just got to throw it in the trash. That's going to happen over a long period of time with a piece of hardware. There's no license management required. Uh, it can be field serviceable. We can ac actually have guys on the road actually service it. I'm going to send you a new pot. Please put one in. Hearns, how are you, buddy? Uh, <coughs> new units can deployed lim uh, that are deployed are limited by the, con uh, the console I.O., right? The cons, let's take a look at the cons here. The, and uh, again, a lot of cons for a sound for hire vendor here. Costly to inventory, lots of space, costly to maintain. I've got to keep a tech repair staff on. I've got to freight things out. Costly to interface. The copper and the rubber and the plastic and the multi-connectors sometimes are more expensive than the actual device that you're interfacing, right? So very expensive to do that. Costly to transport, a lot of rack space, lots and lots of rack space. Uh, you can suffer from flavor of the month syndrome where, you know, one processor is what everybody's hot about and I got to go out and buy a ton of them. Well, guess what? Next month, nobody wants it anymore. Uh, increases to startup expenses. If they have a big rider come in where they're going to have to bring out a lot of uh, who's going to spec a lot of things, they might have to go buy thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of effects processing just to get the tour out the door. So they're already starting in the hole. Uh, it does make for simpler Rider fulfillment, I need an SPX90. I need a 2290. Go get one. There's no, no versions, you know, blah, 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 that we're really worried about there. Just going to go get it. It's costly for the tour to carry spares. They may end up having to buy spare units of this just to send out on the tour that may never see the rack 
but they have to be out there regardless, okay? And finally, it's expensive per channel, right? Per channel. I mean, the exaggerated version of this, if you want to go there, is a Fairchild 670, right? If you can find one, would be $32,000 a channel, right? A plug-in emulation of it that might be 70, 80% of that would be, you know, a few hundred dollars and you could use as many as you have channels for on the console, right? So expensive per channel cost for hardware, all right, just overall. Okay, is this making sense to you? You guys digging in on this? Okay. So let's take a look at it from the user's perspective now. Uh, again, kind of writer friendly. That's a pro thing. I can ask for it and actually they'll be able to deliver it. Uh, console compatibility is not an issue. I, there's no, no place I'm not going to be able to interface it. Uh, I'm going to purchase it once, you know, uh, no expiring operational fee. There's no licensing to be able to use that hardware unit. Uh, no obsolescence tied to the console choice. This is a big one right here, meaning it doesn't matter how long I have it, it'll always be able to interface to the console. Always, right, in this setting. Uh, settings uh, are not contained in the show file. I think that's supposed to be a con. Uh, check. <laughs> I think that's the last name, yeah. Oh, well, actually, that may not be. So easy to loan or borrow units. You know, I can find them readily available everywhere. And quality units in the gray market, like I can get into the used market and, and still find great technology to use in that situation. So there's a lot of pros for the pro user there. He can develop his cache of technology and have it hold value and take it around with him, right? That's the way we worked for years and years and years uh, in live sound in the studios. Cons. <coughs> Yeah, settings not recalled with the show file. That's definitely a con here. I have to actually manage the, the settings of all those processors separately uh, from the actual console. Uh, transport of the presets is challenging. I got to write them down or I got to use some sort of MIDI dump, you know, things like that. It got really complex to do this in the past. Uh, they in and of themselves were bulky and not necessarily easily transportable. You know, you couldn't, uh, in the old days, you couldn't fly with an effects rack. You know, you couldn't check it as luggage. You know, it would have to travel by truck. Uh, expensive per channel, again, that's the con. And uh, the total processing is limited by the console on the I.O. I can only use so many because I only have so much I.O. on the console, right? That's, that's the, the most of them I can use. Whereas, just to contrast it in digital, we don't have that issue in digital. We can use as much as we have DSP for, right? All right, so let's take, uh, let's just kind of sum that up. The love-hate relationship with hardware processing uh, for the manufacturer, they love the number of potential customers. That means lots of revenue. Uh, they hate the expense of R&D and engineering because that eats into margin and profitability. Uh, they hate the serviceability demands. That's operating expenses. That also eats into margin and profitability. They hate the inventory. Eats into margin and profitability. And they hate the used market because they have to compete with it. So even though... This is an important one. There's a whole lot of reasons to not like it as well, right, for manufacturers. For the sound reinforcement uh, vendor, uh, he loves the rental revenue, loves the power of that rental revenue, loves the used market because he can pick up gear uh, on the cheap and still have it uh, and still rent it for maximum price. Uh, hates the expense of having to maintain it. Hates the expense of shelving units. If you've ever been to Claire Brothers and, uh, and looked in their gear inventory, it's mind-blowing. It looks like uh, a scene out of, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, of just gear that's not being used. It's just literally sitting on shelves where they are paying to house it. Um, hate the increased startup cost. There can be a lot of out-of-cash expenses to get something started up with all hardware and hate providing expensive spare units. Uh, spare units that are literally going to sit on the truck until one fails, you know, but yet it doesn't change the cost of it, right? Uh, it's the, the cost of the one that's working. With the pro user, loves the single purchase, uh, loves the used market, uh, hates lugging it around, that's for sure, doesn't want to didn't want to take it around with him everywhere, absolutely hates it when it fails. It's in, you know, it's, it can be affected by environment, all kinds of things like that, and uh, hates how expensive it is per channel, right? So uh, there's some reasons to hate hardware as much as we love the sound quality of it. We're just talking about logistics here. Okay, is that making sense to you guys? So that's kind of the hardware market in a nutshell. Now let's try to, let's compare that, let's flip it over now and look at it against the plug-in market and see what we got going on there. So plug-in processing. Well, in plug-in processing for audio, we have kind of three models that are working uh, in, the, in the market right now for us. We have one that is internal processing, built-in processing. I mean, when you buy the console and turn it on, 
there are reverbs, effects, delays, choruses. All of those things are built into the console. All right, I can't take them out. They're built in. All right, that's one model that is currently working today. <coughs> the next one is third-party plug-in processing that we have to actually install on the console. That's very much the Avid model where we've taken uh, all the third-party manufacturers and being able to install them on the console. Then there is a third version, which is a plug-in server. Uh, we're starting to see great traction with that now where there's actually a, sec an, a separate unit that houses and runs all the plug-ins uh, available to you. And, of course, we can always still attach hardware, although the ability to attach hardware in the in this world is actually very expensive because I.O. is very expensive in a digital console. Right? It's very usually very limited uh, in terms of its capability to do inserts, etc. So it's expensive and we can't interface as much gear as we'd like to. It's also expensive in terms of other areas like latency, etc. that we'll talk about. Okay, So let's breeze right on through this. The pros uh, of built-in processing are certainly that it offers tactile control from the surface. We don't have to go in through the front panel. We can actually operate the reverb and all the other bits and pieces that we want to do on the console. Uh, the settings are integrated with the show file. As I recall a show file, all of my effects processing settings come with it. Uh, on the built-in versions, the consoles account for uh, the latency. They will actually be uh, delay compensated uh, already within the console. You don't have to worry about it, which is actually going to end up being a very, very important component of plugins moving forward, I think. Uh, and then you have a unified show file capability or compatibility, right? I can take this show file to another console of the same make uh, and, and load it and go to work. The cons of it are you have kind of limited choices. You're limited to the choices that the manufacturer thought you should need, right? They made the decision for you. You're just going to use them. Generally speaking, those consoles are not expandable. You can't add more processing to them for the most part. Uh, it can increase the cost of the control of the, of the control surface. Uh, to be able to uh, be able to access them, and the presets for them are not portable. It's hard to take presets. If I've got a if I've got a console that's got a uh, a TC Electronics delay built into it, well, I can't take those presets out and put them in another TC Electronics delay. I can't get them out of the console. They're they're a function of the show file. All right. So there's some good that comes with this. There's some bad that's bads that come with it. Right. As with all of this stuff. So let's take a look at third party processing pros and cons. Uh, same sort of deal. The pro is it's an integrated tactile surface control. Uh, we have the widest variety of manufacturers available for third-party plugins. Uh, there's a ton of people out there making plugins. It's a really, really high quality of processing. Usually speaking, it's a higher quality of processing than the built-in processing. Uh, and again, we can attach the settings to the show file. As we recall a show file, it can recall settings on the external plugin uh, that's been loaded on the console. Uh, the con, and these, these are some serious cons, even though I don't have emphasis built into them here, uh, it can extend the setup time. Now we have to worry about versions. We have to worry about version of plug-in versus version of software con uh, on the console. Uh, can, I get the, can I actually download the plugins? Can I get them here to the vendor without uh, uh, him having an authorization to get them? It gets very, very messy. So it can really extend your setup time if, you, if you're not careful. They can be expensive. They can be expensive comparatively. Uh, they do require licensing, meaning if I buy them and I want to use them, I have to come up with some way of proving that I own it before the console will allow me to use it. Right? Those kind of things are not necessarily conducive to what we do in live sound day to day. You know, time is the enemy there. So these are things that can really uh, trip us up. They can and usually d do require some sort of manual delay compensation within the console. If you guys, are, uh, if this uh, entices you at all, please come to my presentation on delay compensating consoles because this is actually a very big landmine that is sitting uh, with us in digital consoles today. And I'm going to try to show you how to defuse it or at least get around it, OK? Uh, and not widely adopted, you know. It's it, the, the biggest part of the biggest problem with the third party external plugins is uh, they have a very narrow base of where they can be installed. It's very particular of what, what kind of compatibility we have with them. All right, plug-in servers and hardware. Uh, let's take a look at this. The pros server. So uh, obviously the widest uh, compatibility platf uh, platform compatibility is available to an actual server uh, because they, they interface through a common 
uh, audio transport scheme, right? They can offer delay compensation, but only within the unit itself. Uh, and once again, we get back to this situation where the settings are divorced from the show file. Uh, in very few instances does the server actually load its uh, settings from the show file. The cons of that, uh, the choices, we're back to that choice of only being from a single manufacturer. Most of the servers that run only want run one manufacturer's plugins. Uh, often requires an, actually another computer in play just to control the plugins that are in the server. So, you know, we have added points of failure, all kinds of things that come with that server. Uh, there's a separate screen or snapshot management for the server versus the console sometimes, which can get a little uh, dicey to handle. And there can be a higher, uh, there usually is a higher throughput latency because we have to transport from the console out to the server and back. So there's a pathway latency that exists before we even insert the plugin. All right, so that's something we have to contend with as users as well. So the pros of uh, hardware here, uh, as I said, easy and consistent interface, readily available, compatible with all consoles, units hold value over time. Uh, we've kind of been through those. All right. So if we take a look at this again, now let's take a look at how the digital players address uh, effects processing. Remember, we saw the grid earlier that talked about analog. So here are all the digital console manufacturers. And we're going to ask the question, which one of them offer internal effects? Well, some of them do. A handful of them do, but a handful of them do not as well. <coughs> How do they support third-party plug-in processing? How do they get to and from it? Uh, what, time, what, what format do they use? And you can kind of see, even though we're starting to see server try to start to come to the fore here, there's still a lot of different options here. Now, keep in mind, j again, just for context, I'm not necessarily saying, uh, I'll give you an example here, not necessarily saying, uh, let's go to Avid, I know that one, that this is the only option for them. It's just the primary option. I mean, Avid can actually hook up to a wave server as well, but this is their primary option for third-party processing, all right? How about external control? Well, some of them can do it on the surface. Some of them require an external CPU host. Some of them even do it in touch on a screen. I.O. architecture, all over the shop here. Some use Cat5 specific cards. Some use a PCIe bus right in the computer. Some are using MATI I.O., AES50, right on down the line. It's all over the shop there, right? So what you're going to see here, oops, Compare this to our other slide that had all the consistency in it, and you can start to see the problem that we're starting to have in live sound, right, which is just this really inconsistent model of how these things are used. Let's start here at the bottom. Not all the consoles use internal effects processing. Only some of them have external support uh, for third parties in DSP. The rest use a server. Some have touch control. Some have tactile control. Some require another computer in order to just control the processing. Uh, I.O. architectures all over the place as well. So you can see how this could be so disruptive to that mindset of us working console to console to console night after night after night. If we're in that situation where we're going to be moving from console A and processing model A to console B and processing model B, that is not an easy transition, right? We're basically starting over every time we go to one of these consoles, uh, not only in terms of just getting the mix going, but in terms of the usability of it, right? The usability, the interface of it is really, really challenging. So let's jump to this now. Plug-in manufacturer's perspective. Let's go to the, the, the plug-in, uh, the con, pl uh, pros and cons of that. Because you're going to see that I think from the manufacturing perspective, they want to do this. Uh, it's appetizing for a manufacturer to want to build plug-ins. But they're, I mean, in the weirdest kind of way, they're actually, the, the deployment of it in the market, they're actually kind of shooting themselves in the foot here. We're allowing that to happen. So here's the, the main one. So the pros are minimal inventory cost. It costs nothing, just storage space to store plugins, right? That's cheap today. Minimal distribution costs, it's all going to be downloaded from a website. There's not going to be any shipping, anything involved in distributing that plugin. Easy upgrade distribution. Again, software, email can all take care of all of that. Single-ended R&D, right? All they have to do is worry about the code base and the user interface. There's no hardware necessarily to develop unless they're going to do the server. Uh, no reliance on parts vendors. No cogs involved for all intents and purposes. There is no RMA required for tech support, right? I don't need, need to get a return merchandise authorization to get a plug-in back to a manufacturer to repair it. That's just not going to happen, right? It's all done in, in the virtual. The cons, 
and this is a major one, is that you have a potentially very narrow customer base. Now we like, to, you know, for the uninformed, we like to think of the live sound market as being a big thing, a big money player. It's not. It's really, really small. Uh, you know, I mean, when you have a, 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 a plug-in manufacturer who's going to spend R&D time to develop a product where they might only, at the maximum, have 2,000 customers, how much, how much time and energy do you think they're going to put into that? It's just not very much money. They're going to take a long time to recoup their investment, you know. So uh, the idea is they, they need to build for the widest base possible to be able to do that. And sometimes that's difficult to do in live sound. You might even have to have parallel software developments going on. If you want to extend that base, you might have to develop the plugin in native, AAX, DSP, uh, VST, all of these different formats. Well, that requires complete parallel software development for all of those versions. They are not functions of each other. They are actually quite different. Uh, so that requires a lot of maintenance. The ones that are making the most money are going to get the most attention in terms of version upgrades, et cetera, right? Uh, the expensive, uh, it's an expensive, comp uh, extensive compatibility grid, meaning it, one of the cons is it's hard to be compatible with the most amount of consoles. Very, very difficult to do that. Uh, the lifespan is a function of code. Uh, that that's what kind of killed TDM off after a period of time is that it was written in a very, very old kind of archaic code base and it stopped at 24-bit. I mean, it was definitely going to have a lifespan where it had to stop. So, you know, once that's done, then the end of life happens and we're not going to have legacy TDM plugins, you know. It's just not going to work on consoles. Uh, very challenging to secure from pirating and demands a very intense tech support network uh, to be able to support the customers on all this. So, you know, fair amount of cons there, but also a lot of really, really good pl pros there for a plug-in manufacturer. Let's look at it from the sound for hire vendor here because this gets really interesting. Virtual inventory, meaning no storage costs, nothing like that. Very inexpensive build out. I can, ha I can build out an entire tour in the space of four square feet there if I wanted to do it. Uh, reduced startup cost. Plugins in and of themselves generally cost much, much less than the actual, an equivalent version of the actual devices. I actually did a study for Avid uh, or DigiDesign at one point of taking what we would consider normal average on a digital console in terms of its processing model and building that out in actual equipment form, and it was mind-blowing. Uh, it would be a sound for higher vendors' worst nightmare. I mean, the list of stuff you would have to put together in the interface for it would just cost tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, so that's another pro for the sound reinforcement uh, vendor. Easy bid fulfillment. You know, I can put a lot of stuff on that bid, and they can fulfill that very easily with little cost. And really, there's no spares or anything, no, no real repairs uh, for plugins. So that, becomes pretty, that part of it becomes pretty enticing uh, for sound reinforcement vendors if it's all handled really well in terms of deployment, and that's the challenge. So here's the cons for the sound reinforcement vendor. This requires skilled personnel. You've got to have people that understand IT, understand computers, understand virtual assets and how to, how to deal with them. It's not something that's intuitive. It's different for every manufacturer. And that's one of the biggest problems right now. The authorization schemes, the downloadability, all of these things are different manufacturer to manufacturer. Uh, license management uh, and loss of bid leverage, right? Uh, it, it would be very hard for a plug or for a sound reinforcement vendor to be negotiating with a client and say, you know what, I'm just going to throw in all the plugins for free, and and you know to try to entice the deal. And well, the the guys are going to go, well, I thought the plugins would come with the deal anyway. You mean you're charging me for those, right? It's that whole kind of expected freedom of digital assets. You know, it's digital, so we don't expect to have to pay for it. You know, that's a reality we, that's th that exists in the world. All right, let's look at it from the pro user's expense, uh, perspective, which is really good, actually. So the pro for the, pl uh, uh, the user is the sheer amount of processing available. I mean, you're just never going to want for processing for all intents and purposes. Like, you know, in the old days of analog, you know, I used to, you know, require an input list from the act I was going to work with. We'd have to build out, kind of figure out what processing we're going to use, et cetera. I, I don't even think like that anymore. I just show up and use things as I need them, you know. I mean, they're all available on the console. There's no shipping in of gear or presaging gear for the most part. Uh, the processing in and of itself can sound fantastic. I, I, 
Uh, if, again, if you come to the plug-in latency discussion that I'm going to do a little bit later, we're going to talk about this a little bit. But the plugins on whole sound fantastic. Uh, and they're consistent. One sounds, if I have 10 1176 plugins in place, guess what? They all sound exactly the same. If I have a rack of 10 1176s over here, every one of them is going to sound different. Okay? Compatibility or capability advances, meaning there are things we can do in plugins in terms of processes that literally cannot be done in the analog or the actual world, all right? We can do things in that world. Uh, it's USB portability. Uh, we can have all these plugins sitting on a USB key. We can have authorization sit on a USB key and travel with it. Uh, there is no portability cost. The presets store in the show file, and they're easily snapshotable, meaning as I recall songs, I can recall settings, right? So the cons of it for the pro user are it's a disposable technology. I'm going to invest in it. It's going to have a lifespan and then I'm going to throw it away, right? There's not going to be any resale. There will not be a gray market, for the most part, for plugins, other than people that are really, really working on the lagging end of the technology and want to get it to work. The thing with it, though, is the manufacturers are never going to support it after a period of time. They're always going to end of life a digital product, and after two, three, four years, or until the parts run out, they will not support it after that. And there probably will not be a cottage industry of people that will crop up to, to service those consoles. I just can't see that happening. I could be wrong, but I, I doubt that's going to happen. Obviously, there's licensing challenges here. You know, some console or some plug-in manufacturers, you can buy the license once and uh, use it forever. Sometimes they'll, they'll time bomb the auth authorizations to try to offset pirating. Or you, even though you own it, in three months, it's going to, that time is going to time out. You're going to have to go reauthorize it again before you can use it. You know, boot it up on your console one day and it's going to say, sorry, can't can't use it. Got to go reauthorize it. You know, so those are real real challenges for people that are out in the field using it, and they can be kind of difficult to operate at times. You know, uh, you know, there's parts of us as, as audio guys that don't necessarily want to take a mouse and a trackball and go in and operate a processor with, through a big PA system. You know, it can be a little dicey at times. Right. So those are some cons of that. All right. So let's go through the uh, love hate relationship here. So uh, <coughs> manufacturers. They love no hardware vendors, right? No cogs to deal with. Uh, love high margin. These are very, very high margin, very profitable things when they're in place. They must be because if you can sell something, a processor at $49 or $29 and make profit on it, they got to be doing something right, right? Uh, it's an inexpensive value add to their products. If they're selling the products, they can include plug-in plug -in bundles to actually add value to it. Uh, which I think is ironic because the sound for higher vendors guys can't can't get away with that. Uh, they hate the customer service demands, though. You know, there's a lot of interaction between customers and the manufacturer when they do these plugins. You know, uh, whether it's usability, uh, getting it working on the console, whatever. You know, they have to have a lot of interaction, which they do not like to have to do. You guys ever try to go to a website and try to get a phone number to call one of these companies? Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, the thing they hate also is the shrinkage of the customer base, right? If, if I've got a set of plugins that only work on the Avid console, well, guess what? I, can, I only have Avid customers at my disposal, right? So that's, that's never been the case that had hardware before. Uh, and they hate the product in constant development, believe it or not. Uh, so I even though they do this where they'll release it to a certain point and get it out there to try to offset cost, they also realize that that plugin or that processor is going to be in constant version development over time until the end of its life. So that requires that they essentially have their hands on it all throughout its life. You know, that's an operating expense and it gets expensive over time. So for the sound reinforcement vendor, no shelved inventory, no, no uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, easy rider fulfillment, lower startup costs. Uh, they hate dealing with the authorization challenges though, I can tell you right now. I mean, here we are in the virtual age and if they want, uh, because of the licensing restrictions, if they want to get licenses moved out to a client on tour, a lot of times what has to happen is that person will have to either FedEx an iLock to them to get the auth put on it, or they will have to create another iLock and FedEx it out to the tour to get that to happen. Now think about the lunacy of that. We're in, we're in a situation where that should be managed through a central site, and we still don't have the ability to do that in 2018. It's crazy. Uh, let's see. Where was I here? 
It's dealing with automation, yeah, and hates dealing with download challenges. One of the other big challenges that we have, and again, it's, it's because they we're not really dealing with the live sound market properly, is, you know, one of the things we want to be able to do is I want to be able to call a sound reinforcement vendor and say, I'm going to be coming in with my show file. These are the plugins I have in the show file. Please get the, the show file ready on one of your consoles and get it going. Yet they can't go and download the plugins without the authorization. So I end up having to do it on day of day of show, which is the worst possible time to be doing that kind of stuff, right? So again, that's a, that's a lack of realization of the plugin manufacturers of the actual workflow here. All right, so here's a comparison of those two charts, right, that we kind of looked at, <coughs> and just kind of comparing strengths here. This is a unified experience, meaning it doesn't matter what console, what plugins, etc. We're all kind of working in the same mode. It's very uh, very communal here where this becomes very tribal, right? This is very tribal, very siloed. Uh, the strength of it, obviously, is flexibility and repeatability, immediacy of the processing, set settings management, but the deployment of it is positively awful right now. This has to get shored up. We, we're not going to be able to continue this on, it's it, especially if it gets more disparate and splinters out even more. You know, it's going to get worse and worse. All right, so let's take a look at the state of authorization. You'll kind of get some sense of it here. This is just a few plug-in manufacturers that I pulled into line here. Obviously, this is uh, what they use as an authorization device. Uh, Avid uses an iLock USB. Uh, plug-in Alliance uses a USB key, not an iLock, or you can do a machine authorization. But if you're using machine authorization, you've got to be able to take that authorization on and off of the com console if you're going to go day to day. Uh, some others use iLock. Uh, Universal Audio uses a hardware authorization, believe it or not. That, that unit actually has to get connected to the Internet th to get authorized. Uh, and then, of course, Waves uses a USB key uh, and machine authorization as well, but it's a timed bomb uh, authorization. I think it's good for three months, and then you have to re-up it. Okay? So again, the point of all of this is just to say it's really messy right now, really, really messy and hard to stay on top of. All right, so here's some harsh truths. Ready for all these? I think we'll just make it here. So for the manufacturers, the disparity in the console designs makes each system increasingly unique. This is not a good thing. Even though we want to think it's a good thing as a manufacturer, it's not a good thing because <coughs> we're only going to be as we're only going to have as many cons uh, customers as we make good consoles, right? I mean, it, you know, that customer base can shrink very quickly if you, especially if you make something that is really unique and where you're trying to kind of change the world a little bit, as soon as somebody gets their hands on it and they start using it regularly, they, they don't necessarily want to go somewhere else. Well, you don't want to be the other guy that they don't go to there, right? So it's, it's, that's a tough one. Uh, in terms of the disparity in design and the workflow philosophies of all these uh, consoles, the pressure now shifts to the sound for higher vendor, believe it or not, because uh, they have to have staff members who are fluent in all of these consoles and all of these processing designs and their implementation. I mean, the, the guys that work in these shops actually end up having to be very, very sharp to be able to handle and, and set up and prepare all these consoles for all the different tours. Uh, it's actually a great school. If you want to go learn about consoles and all of this stuff, go to work for a sound company now. You're going to have your hands on every console every day of the week. You know, For pro users, Show file simplification takes place if the console of choice is unavailable. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, and, and this to me, this is one of the biggest kind of hidden, unseen things that is happening in our industry right now, is that the sound quality of the shows is suffering simply because if we go console to console, night overnight, we have to dumb down our approach on the console. We have all this incredible capability, but we got to dumb it down to some commonality so we can actually go and survive each interface of the console. As I said earlier, there are, there are guys out there right now that are turning down gigs because there's a console involved in the gig that they don't know how to operate. Right? So we end up simplifying when, we, when in fact we should be expanding and making things better. Uh, disparity in the requirements to download plugins. That I kind of mentioned this when I touched on this one a little uh, earlier. Uh, for the plug-in manufacturers, they all have differing download requirements. Just something as simple as downloading the plug-in to get it ready on the, require, uh, on the console requires all kinds of different hoops to be jumped through, uh, jumped through here. Uh, for sound reinforcement vendors, it makes prepping systems wildly hard. 
uh, just really, really challenging. You know, and as I said, the last thing you want to be doing on a show day is downloading and installing third-party processing. It sounds like it just should be so easy. Why well, you just download it and put it on? You get into all kinds of version conflicts. All kinds of things can happen. You actually put the system at risk when you're doing it. Uh, that's the harsh reality of it. Uh, and we just don't have the time as a walk-up to do those kind of things. So what you end up invariably doing is just stripping all of that out of your show file and not using it just to be able to get through day to day to day and be consistent and, and reliable with it. Challenges with the virtual inventory. Um, again, disparity in the authorization processes for the plug-in manufacturers. Uh, they all do it different. Uh, I kind of mentioned this one where we were talking about, uh, you know, FedExing out iLocks and stuff. The authorization schemes uh, are geared so heavily at toward studios and facilities that have their own networks. They're not thinking about what happens with a sound reinforcement vendor who wants to take a virtual asset that they have in their inventory and move it out to a tour's iLock. It's actually very difficult to do that right now. It's, it's just not set up to do it. Uh, and for pro users, really difficult to uh, integrate personal and virtual assets. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, we have situations now <laughs> where it gets really dicey where a manufacturer, you know, somebody like Claire Brothers is really good about this, where they will say, we're going to provide a console that has this bundle of plugins on it because we've tested it, we know it all works, it has these versions on it. And now I show up as a pro user and think, well, I've got these other plugins that I want to use. Now, can't load them on there because it's going to possibly destabilize the console and we take the hit for that, right? So it makes it tough now. You know, it's not just plugging in. You know, you're never going to plug in a Yamaha SBX90 and say, there's a chance it's going to destabilize the entire system when I do that, right? That, that would never happen, right? But that's a reality. That's a reality in the world of plugins. So there's some challenges to what we got going on there. And then latency, right? This is a big one. I, and I'm doing a big presentation on this here. I'm going to probably upset some people with some things I'm going to say at this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. So for plug-in manufacturers, they actually <laughs> really don't want to have to deal with this because it's a very, very big engineering lift to put in automatic delay compensation in a digital console. Uh, Basically, think of it this way. To be able to do it and do it effectively, you've got to incorporate the possibility of delay at every single potential signal crossing point in the system. And then have the ability to calculate all the different offset paths and impart the right delay at the right point of the path to realign the entire console. That is a huge engineering lift. I, I've watched us do it at Digit Design with Pro Tools. I know what went into that, and it's very, and that's a very limited architecture. You put something like this in play, now you've got a whole other uh, can of bees that you're going to take the top off of. All right, so they don't really want to do it, but they're, they're going to end up having to do it at some point. For sound reinforcement vendors, the problem with latency is that it can negatively impact the sound quality of their shows, um, and this is a central theme in this plugin presentation. I'm going to do. Uh, where, you know, we, we have this, there's this kind of sentiment out in the market right now, you can kind of feel it, where, you know, I've heard guys say, well, I went to see that show and they was using all these plugins and it sounded like crap. Well, there's a reason for it, right? And I, I would bet you dimes to donuts many times that guys that are using lots of plugins for the most part are not compensating for the latency it is actually creating within the console and all the phase cancellation that it's creating in the console. So, you know, sound reinforcement vendors have no control over that, right? Once it gets out there and they start doing all these things, that, that could negatively impact the sound of the show, which it negatively impacts their brand, right? So there's challenges there to deal with that. Uh, certainly for less experienced engineers who really don't understand the impact of those latencies within the console. For pro users, it makes throw and go really, really challenging. Uh, and of course, when we start talking about latency, it's a really big challenge for monitor engineers, right? Because we can't we can't really effectively delay compensate those consoles because they're imparting an entire uh, buffer for the entire console. You know, it, you're going to penalize all the inputs uh, for for one latency compensation within the console, right? So you got to be very, very careful with it there. That's a unique challenge for live sound for sure. So this is this is actually a very, very serious thing that we got going on in our world right now, and I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with it. Totally. And, you know, the next hard question I got to ask, you know, at some point, uh, even though I work for a company that promotes this, is uh, are third-party plugins the right thing for live sound? You know, at some point, we may have to back up and ask that question, you know. 
because of the deployment of it. You know, the deployment of it is what's killing us right now. Uh, and, you know, it's making it hard for manufacturers. It's making it hard for everybody involved right now. There's lots of penalty involved in it because of the way the industry is actually deploying it. So, <coughs> And then, you know, also ask the question, maybe are built-in processors the way to go? There's a part of me, i, I got to be honest with you, for as much as I love plug-in processing, I love the choices available to it, to it I, I would be thrilled to be able to take out a console that had a very comprehensive set of built-in processing in it and not have to worry about this latency issue. You know, know that it's taken care of within the console uh, because it's been well-engineered. It's, it's in a very controlled environment there where they can deal with it. You know? There's a part of that that is appetizing, for, certainly for a one-off, right? where I may not be able to do all of this processing that I want to do. So, you know, these are questions we got to ask. And we have to be the ones to ask them. If we, if we're not, if we rely on the manufacturers to ask and answer these questions, we're going to get whatever they think we need, you know. And, I, you know, I've, I've held a unique position in my life where I've been right in between both of those things. I've been a high-level pro user and an executive at a, at a manufacturer, and I know the push-pull that happens between those two sensibilities. And believe me, there's plenty of times that as a manufacturer, we've released what we thought you needed. And then there are many times where you've told us you want something, you've, I need this, when in fact it's not what you want at all. You know? uh, so there's, there's this big balancing act that needs to play, take place. So I'm hoping that AES can be a big part of this someday, where we can create a much more usable dialogue between pro users, sound for hire vendors, and the manufacturers, and kind of coalesce some of this together and and get a little more unified <laughs> in our efforts here. I mean, we're still in such the earliest days of digital consoles and digital processing. You kind of knew it was going to be messing at the beginning, but at some point it needs to kind of refocus and clean back up. Otherwise, we're, we're never going to survive all of this, you know. Okay. Whew. Two minutes to spare. That's a lot, man. That's a, that's a dense set there. And, uh, but it's really something we need to think about. Uh, so I'll use this uh, to shamelessly plug this other presentation that I'm doing. If, you're, if this is at all on your mind, thinking about this, all this stuff going forward, please come to the latency discussion. I think I do one here at 2 or 3 o'clock today. Uh, like I said, I'm going to give you the real insight to what's happening in these consoles with uh, external processing. Uh, even if you're using outboard hardware and you're going to bring it into the digital console, it still creates latency problems for you. Uh, and how to ch how to solve these problems? At least have some sort of solution uh, in your grasp to be able to deal with it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. I won't be able to do any audio demonstrations of it. I'm hoping I have enough credibility uh, with you that when I say the difference between a manually compensated, fully compensated console and one that is not is not subtle. It is not subtle. It, it scared me to death. I actually did it for real and listened to the two comparisons. Of, of the two mixes, I was like, oh my gosh, I will never not do this again. Never. So please come to that presentation. Let's do a little bit of Q&A. We can do a couple of minutes of Q&A here. You guys got any questions on what you've seen here? Like I said, this was a huge kind of dense thing. So uh, I'll throw up the mic here. Hello. Hello. Check. Anybody got any questions? You want to chat about anything? I can go back over anything you want to talk about. Do you guys experience these kind of things? Uh, you guys out in the field, are you experiencing these kind of challenges dealing with some of these things? I mean, I think overall, I mean, I'd probably have to give Waves the credit for doing the best job of kind of trying to unify the experience for everybody, trying to come up with the server option. Uh, but yet there are still some real holes in that, I mean, in terms of what we actually get as users. I mean, it's still just one manufacturer's palette of plugins. That, I mean, granted, it's a great one. They make great plugins. They give you great choices. But still, now we're taking, we've basically taken a console and attaching it to our console, right? Uh, and, and delivering plugins to it. I mean, thank goodness we can do it via MADI, but still, we have all the latency issues that are involved in it. We have all the usability issues. It, it still can threaten the system stability, all the kinds of things, you know. So it's not perfect by any stretch of imagination. But at least it could be imperfect for all the consoles, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, could at least use, we could at least have that, that danger for everybody. So uh, that part of it is kind of cool. Yes, Mr. Rat. Yeah, it's it's
I agree. I agree. I agree. I, I, the term I've uh, coined to kind of try to describe it and get people to understand what's happening, which I'll cover in that presentation, is mix impulse. You know, as we start to take numbers of inputs and make inputs later and later and later, the impulse of that mix actually starts to decline. I mean, we, we've proven it, this is not new news, guys. We, this is what we went through in the studio when we started mixing in the box. That was the realization that the studio engineers had kind of gone, wow, this is not right. And once we put together delay compensated engines in Pro Tools, all of a sudden everybody was like, ah, yeah, okay, now that's sounding right again. You know, it was, and again, like I said, it's not subtle. And we're talking about samples of difference here between inputs that we're creating here, you know. So it, it, it sounds like it should be okay. It's the elephant in the room, I'm telling you. It's the elephant in the room. Certainly for live sound, we're going to have to we're going to have to come to terms with this at some point as manufacturers and as users, and figure out the best way to get get rid of this stuff because it's causing problems that we don't even want to realize right now. Okay, all right, that's all I got for you. It's uh, noon. That means we eat and then we come back and we talk more audio. Okay. Next, are you coming up, Dave? You're you're next, right? Yeah. I didn't mean to run you off of Dave's thing. <laughs> yeah. Dave's just going to talk by himself in here for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it for that, guys.